it's nice to meet you all, I have to say. So the topic today I'm going to talk about is the third molar surgery and nerve injury. Um, from a dent dentist perspective, uh, this is something I've been working for many years since the day I graduated. It has been a very important topic, especially nowadays uh, patients know know more and they know their rights and also sometimes they, they are not happy with the result. They may sue. So as dentists, uh, as surgeons, um, how can we protect ourselves? How can we make give the best um, uh, opinion, uh, clinical decisions to our, to our patients while not uh, making them unhappy is very important. So coming one year, one hour, I'm going to talk about this and uh, we have a Q&A sessions afterwards and hopefully uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have some information and fun tonight. Okay, okay so first of all, uh, I'm from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, our school has been ranked world number one for three years. Uh, but of course, for the past two years, we have ranked number four. If you would like to watch football, you know these things goes up and down and we don't care too much about it. But we have been proud that we, we have been uh, winning and like Liverpool, we may come back again. Uh, and the photo, I believe, is the, um, is the Department of Oral and Maxillary Surgery uh, and many of our trainees um, are like still training here and I'm doing mostly the uh, maxillofacial stuff relating to benign pathologies, uh, TMJs, orthonavic surgeries. Uh, Dr. Richard Su, the one on the left on the photo, is doing most of the reconstruction and oncology. I have to uh, say, um, even though as academia, I am spending maybe 80 to 90 percent of my time of my time still practicing uh, clinical work. I do a lot of, most of my research still on clinical work and um, that's the, where my interest is. But of course, uh, as, a, and as an academia, I have to publish, I have to research and I have to do a lot more things like, uh, for example, speaking on TV is also part of my job as a, a staff in the university. Uh, so apart from what I'm going to talk about tonight, on nerve injuries and third molars, uh, most, many of my work are on orthonavic jaw correction surgeries. Uh, and that is my big interest because I can make people bite better and look better. And I'm also doing a lot of TMJ surgeries. Uh, most of them hopefully don't need surgeries, but uh, I do do some of these and also a lot of the benign pathologies. So knowing more about myself, for those who don't know me, I am a very keen football player. I played a lot uh, when I was young. And I see some of my teammates also attending this lecture. Uh, nice to meet you all, all here. And this keeps me energetic and uh, physically fit as well. I'm also uh, learning to do sailing. Uh, the first thing you go on to a very cool boat is to ask someone to take a picture like this to make you look cool, uh, but I'm still actually learning how to sail. I have two monkeys at home and they are growing. They are Luca and Levia, eight and five years old. Uh, luckily they are sleeping, so you won't see them tonight, hopefully. So going to tonight's uh, topic, uh, we all see patients with third molar surgery. It's so common. People have uh, done some research, at least 70 to 80% of these teeth has to be removed or they will cause some pathologies. And a lot of these will cause um, pain or like periodontal disease, pericoronitis, and they come to see us as dentists. And for like this gentleman coming to see you with a swollen face, swollen gum, and a partially uh, impacted tooth, what will you do? If that tooth you take an x-ray and it comes out to be like this, you will know that, oh wow, I won't have a very easy life because it lies exactly on the nerve and you start to worry because that, that tooth has to go, the patient is in pain, shall I do it or shall I not do it? What should I do? Because I know if I take it out, you are going to cut the nerve or at least have some damage to the nerve. That is the big worry to yourself as well as to the patients. What will we do? So this lecture is a lot of Q&A in this lecture. Throughout this lecture, it's all about questions and hopefully some answers. And I'm going to try to ask some questions 
that are relevant to the third molar surgery and nerve injury that are of great clinical relevance. They are not purely on research, they are of great clinical relevance. And commonly asked by dentists or even patients every day. And I'll try to answer them with an evidence-based approach, with some evidence that is supported by research. Dentist application is the most important. Like all the research I'm doing, I try to answer some clinical questions because I think answering these questions will change our clinical practice and hopefully will help our patients. So it's relating to us as dentists on the daily patient's care every day. And as, a, as my role as an academic staff, as an academia, as a researcher, I hope to use my knowledge in research or at least what I don't know to find out what we can help our patients from our perspective to help the dentist as well as to our patients in our daily care to them. So eight is a very good number to Chinese and I'm going to ask eight questions tonight. Number one is how likely will I have a nerve injury in taking this wisdom tooth out? Sounds familiar, huh? because uh, this is a question that many patients would love to know. The patients will also ask you, if I have a nerve injury, how likely will I recover? And when will I recover? What are the nerve deficit effects to these patients? These are very important questions because we have to uh, uh, stand in their uh, feeling to know how they feel. And what are the treatment options and outcomes if there are nerve injuries? We're going to ask tonight also, when should a third molar of high nerve injury risk be removed? And how can I predict the risk of nerve injury? And hopefully I'll also give you some technical tips to reduce nerve injury. And of course the hot topic, if you have heard of coronectomy, is cutting the crown of a wisdom tooth out. Is it safe in long term? So let's kick started. As a football fan and also a football player myself, this slide uh, is very important, but we have to wait for some years. Hopefully next year we can watch some real international football. So question one, our patients ask us, how likely will I have nerve injury in taking this wisdom tooth out? Patients like to ask these questions. Um, they like to have some figures. They want to uh, judge it by themselves even though you may say, well, 5%, 10%, actually to them, it's, it's not quite meaningful because, well, if it happens on them, I tell them if it happens on you, it is 100%. And only I can tell from a very large cohort, very large sample size, this is a figure. So in, if you search the literature, the risk of inferior dental nerve injury, ID nerve injury, is 0 0.26 to 8.4%. And for lingual nerve, it's 0.1% to 22%. To be honest, if you tell this to a patient, this is quite meaningless because like 0 to 22%, it can be anything. If I tell them it's 0 to 100%, it means nothing. So these are not very useful figures, I have to say. And sometimes patients, if you tell this, they will not be very happy. Why are these figures so different? I, we have to understand people do research, they have different uh, methodology, um, they may have uh, different operators levels. Some are done by uh, maybe surgeons, some are done by general dentists, some are by uh, dental students. Uh, they may also have a mixed variety of surgical technique, like a lingual split technique. They may use different instruments. Some of them just report temporary numbness because they may only see the patient once but not following up on them so versus permanent and maybe publication bias if you do something uh, if you find out that well my nerve injury risk is 50 percent you probably won't like to publish it so there may be a publication bias so that's why worldwide figures vary so much and can we have any regional or local data in at least the Asia Pacific region that we can have uh, relevance and reference to. So this is a study that I published uh, in 2010. Uh, this means a lot to me. This is a study in the IJOMS, uh, um, the, the, like the Bible of the MaxFax people. Um, it's a paper 
that I'm very proud of because this is the first study that I got involved when I became a houseman when I first graduated um, under the supervision of Professor Lim Jung. So this is a prospective study. Um, the data were, was collected from 1998 to 2005, and they were all performed under local anesthesia in the Prince Philip Dental Hospital in Hong Kong. It was the largest study in, at, that, at those days, uh, largest prospective study with over 4,000 teeth. And it were mostly done by uh, undergraduates and also junior residents. That means these teeth are more or less a general dental practitioner's level. You can see that most of them are partially erupted. The winter's line um, are like four, six mm. So they are not super deep. They are not those uh, that requires a specialist to operate these uh, day in, day out, third molars that a general dentist will see. So just come quickly to the conclusion, the inferior dental nerve or I inferior avian nerve, that is a more proper term. The deficits at week one, immediate post-op is about 0.35% in our cohorts in this study. And for lingual nerve injury is slightly more, it's about 0. 7% at week one. And we found out the risk factors. What are the risk factors? For ID nerves is mostly the death of impaction. It's highly significant. The deeper it is, the more likely it will hurt the nerve. Well, it makes sense because if it's deeper, that means it's closer to the nerve, right? While for lingual nerve, there are other factors like operator's experience. If they are inexperienced, they are more likely to have the lingual nerve deficits, or if they have a if they are distal angularly impacted, this is also highly significant. Why distal angular impaction hurts a lingual nerve? Well, this is easily explained because, for example, like this tooth, and if you recall, the lingual nerve lies very very close to the lingual plates at the distal part of the third molar region. So if the path of withdrawal is going distally and sometimes it may be going distal lingually, then even a temporary scratch or a tension at that area may hurt the nerve, not to mention it may uh, cut the nerve if the uh, flap is raised too distally. So answering this question quickly, a summary of this, of this question's answer, how likely will I have a nerve injury in taking this with some tooth out? If they just want a figure, an overall figure is about 1% for added ID nerve and lingual nerve deficits if they all add together. So patients will know, okay, oh, 1%, the chance is low. But this is a very general figure that, of course, is uh, included all kinds of impactions and death and also. All okay, so here comes the second question. If the patient asks you, if I have a nerve injury, well, you tell them you have 1% chance of having a nerve injury. And he comes, keep asking you, if I have a nerve injury, how likely will I recover? And maybe when will I recover? So the same study also look at the recovery pattern in long term. We talk about at week one, the chance of ID deficit is 0.35%. And for lingual nerve, it's about 0.7%. We also follow them up in long term. What do I mean by long term? It's like two years. For permanent numbness of ID nerve is about 0.12%, while for lingual nerve is about 0.16%. What does it mean? It means extremely, extremely low. If we really look it up in long term, and then uh, actually we look it up to uh, three years, and that is the, um, the good thing about doing research in Hong Kong because we live so close to each other, uh, and the patients can easily travel to a dental hospital to review compared to many centers if they have to drive one hour or even one and a half, two hours to a dental hospital for a, just a checkup, they probably don't want it. So uh, the privilege of Hong Kong is that we can follow up the patients in long term, which is very good for prospective study. For ID nerve deficits, we can see that they heal quickly if they have any. They heal quickly within the first three months. And by three months time, about 50% of them will recover. 
However, if about two years time, you will find out that about two thirds of them will recover. How about after two years, they will not improve anymore.